Good afternoon. I'm really honored to be here today, and I wanted to make sure that everybody knew who I was representing. Um, I want to know how many people in the audience here take care of neonates? Who's the neonatologist? Oh, there's actually quite a few of you. That's excellent. Well, to the rest of you, all I can say is keep working really hard, and maybe one day we'll let you come take care of babies with us. <laughs> all right. As you can tell, I'm a little bit biased. Um, but I, I think, really, babies have been a, a wonderful experience to take care of. I do have some um, disclosures. Um, I have no commercial interest in NAVA. Jennifer and Christo, are you hearing me? I get no royalties. We need to talk about it. Um, but I, I do get support from McCabe to go and talk about these things. Um, we've used NAVA in Toledo since 2008, and we've used non-invasive NAVA since it became available in the United States since 2010. We've done over 800 babies on either NAVA or NIV-NAVA, so our clinical experience is very extensive, and we've done over 50 patients in the pediatric ICU as well. Now, tomorrow we're going to hear a state-of-the-art talk about chronic lung disease in neonates, and we're going to hear about the causes of chronic lung disease, whether it's barotrauma, volutrauma, atelectotrauma, biotrauma. And we're not sure exactly which one does it. But as my mentor, Alan Job, always used to teach me, the most dangerous and highest risk of a neonate getting chronic lung disease is a neonatologist with an endotracheal tube in his hand waiting to put it in. If we can keep the endotracheal tube out, there's a much lower risk of chronic lung disease or damage to the lungs. However, non-invasive ventilation is still ventilation but without an endotracheal tube. And with NIV-NAVA, we know that it's synchronous. But what we don't know in neonates yet is, is it safe and is it effective? I, I can see you taping me here. I walk around a lot. Am I going to drive you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, I apologize, but I, I really can't stand still. All right, so to start with NIV-NAVA, we're going to do a little case presentation. So I have a 26-weeker, 655 grams, extubated on day one to non-invasive NAVA. He was on NIV-NAVA for six days, and then he went to a high-flow nasal cannula. Case two, which we'll look at, is a 23-weeker, 650 grams. Now, keep in mind, the borderline of viability is 22 to 23 weeks. Ten years ago, 95% of babies at 23 weeks would die. Today, about 40 to 50% of 23-weekers die just because they're too immature. So we're talking really the most immature patients that we can see. This baby was on NAVA invasively by two hours of age, extubated at 36 hours of age, non-invasive NAVA, was on that for a week, then went to CPAP, and then high flow. So over here, we're going to see a video um, of our babies. Let's see if I can pull it up. I have jammed. I'm walking around so much. It must be. <laughs> ah, there we go. All right, so on the one side, you're going to see the 26 weekend. On this side, you'd see the 23 weekend. And we'll just see a video of both of them on non invasive ventilation. And as you can see, their work of breathing is not very high at all. They're not very tachypnic. They look extremely comfortable. Now, Ten years ago, this was unheard of. We would never have babies this tiny and this fragile or ventilators looking this good. With non-invasive ventilation in general, this has helped us. And with NIV-NAVA, I feel that we can take it now one step further. The question that I get from physicians all around the country in the United States who are trying to use NAVA and NIV-NAVA in their neonatal intensive care units is, how do I pick the NAVA level? And in fact, the question goes even deeper than that. What is the NAVA level? And I struggled with this concept for quite a long time. So what I'm going to share with you a little bit is my understanding of what this is. Now, we all know it's a proportionality constant that changes the electrical activity of the diaphragm into a proportional pressure. That's how it works mechanically in the ventilator. But conceptually, the higher the NAVA level is, the more work of breathing mechanical diaphragm or the ventilator is doing. The lower the NAVA level, the more work of breathing the patient is doing. 
and the goal is to unload the work of breathing from the patient to the ventilator without over-assisting the patient, keeping in mind that the patient continues to be in charge the whole time. The ventilator's helping, but the patient's in charge. All right, everyone with me? Okay, now, for about two or three years, I taught this. I spoke about it all over the place, but I didn't understand it. I mean, I could say the words. And one day I went to the gym, and I was doing an exercise. You know the one where you hang from a bar, and you're supposed to pull yourself up and down, and you pull yourself up and you go down. And I thought, you know, this is like breathing. Inspiration, expiration. Inspiration, expiration. However, when you've got a belly like me, and you hang from the bar, it's very hard to do. So I use tricks. I grunt, or I use my accessory muscles. I bring my knees up, I bounce. I try to do all these tricks to try and do a pull up, but I can't do it. I get about halfway, and then I have fatigue. So that would be the equivalent of being in respiratory distress. I can't take a full inspiration. So in my gym, we have this machine. Have you seen it? It's a cheat machine. What you do is you put your knees over here, and then you can take some of your weight off with this machine so that the machine thinks you weigh less. And now it becomes easier to do the pull-up. So while I'm standing there, I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is Nava. So I got my training friend, Kathy, to come and help me do this. So here we have the machine, and Kathy's going to get on the machine, and she's going to try and do a pull-up. Now, Kathy really can do a pull-up. She's just faking over here. But you can see she weighs too much, and she can't breathe in. She can't do an inspiration or an expiration. So now we're going to unload her. We've turned her Nava level up a little bit. So now she can get up about halfway. We've unloaded her, and she's doing better. Now we turn her Nava level up even further. Now she can do a full inspiration, expiration. Inspiration, expiration. Because she's adequately unloaded. But how about if we over-assist her, and we increase her Nava level even further? Now once we've done it, she can do these pull-ups really easily. But look at her effort, her EDI is now really low. She does this with just her fingers. OK, now let me stop it for a moment. So you see how simple it is for her to do. Now, even though it's really simple for her to do this pull-up, she's just using her fingers, when she does this, because she's over-assisted, she doesn't go flying off the top of the machine and hit the ceiling. She can only go to the top of the machine, and then she comes back down again. And even though we've made it really easy for her to do by unloading her to the machine, she is still in control. She decides when does she want to do a pull-up, how fast does she want to do it, does she want to go halfway or all the way, does she want to get to the, stop, the top and pause, or does she want to come straight down again. So she's in complete control of her respiratory effort or her pull-ups, all we've done is unloaded her to the machine. That's all that Nava is. My question is, this machine costs about 2,000 American dollars. <laughs> Why does your machine cost so much? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the other concept that was brought up today was we heard about pressure limiting, that we set a pressure limit on the ventilator and the ventilator pops off at five below. So the question then is, how high should we set the pressure? As neonatologists, we are terrified of barotrauma. And barotrauma has been known to be a big cause of um, chronic lung disease. So we know that if a baby gets a pressure of 30, that's going to give him chronic lung disease. But remember that if you set the ventilator rate at 50, times per minute, which is a typical respiratory rate for a neonate, that's 70,000 breaths a day. And if you get 70,000 breaths a day at a pressure of 30, you will get chronic lung disease in that baby. So we were very concerned about how much pressure we allow babies to get. And we initially set our pressure limits low so that we would protect these babies' lungs from barotrauma. But let me show you what happens when we set a pressure limit. 
So now we're going to pressure limit Kathy by taking a bar and, come on, there you go. So Chuck has now put this pressure limit over Kathy. So when she does the pull-ups, she can only do it to her pressure limit. We have now taken away her ability to do a side breath. Remember Krista and Jennifer both talked in their talks about side breaths or recruiting breaths. She is unable to take a full inspiratory effort. And after a while, she's going to develop atelectasis, muscle fatigue, because she's not going to be able to take a proper breath. So we took this concept and we said, you know, this is all fun and games and everything, but does it really apply to babies? So we did a study where we did a Nava titration on them, on a ventilator, not on the other machine. And what we did was we put them on a Nava level of 0.5 all the way up to 4 in increments, and we changed it every three minutes. And here's the result from a typical patient. And you can see that at low Nava levels, you see a steady increase as we unload the patient until we reach a point where even though we increase the pressure, the, the Nava level further, the pressure really flattens out. But what you see instead is that the respiratory drive, the EDI, starts to fall. That point there is the break point or the sweet spot where we've unloaded the patient adequately but we haven't over-assisted the patient. And that's the area that we try to get to clinically. So looking at our data collectively, we were able to show that when we normalized the patients to the break point, below their NAVA level, they were under-assisted, and above their NAVA level, the pressure really leveled off. Now, when we started picking the NAVA level, we would follow what the company said. Try and adjust your NAVA level to do the same as you're doing with conventional ventilation and then flip over to NAVA. But what about the baby that you're going to extubate to non-invasive NAVA? How do you know what NAVA level to pick? Or what if this patient has never been intubated and you have to start from nowhere to non-invasive NAVA? Where to go with that? So the same patient population, after we did this titration study at the time of extubation, we extubated them and we put them on non-invasive NAVA and we repeated the study. And what you can see is a couple of things. First of all, we saw a shift of our mean breakpoint up about 50%, 40 to 50%. So the breakpoint shifted towards higher support. And we also saw an increase in the average peak pressure that the babies were needing. Now, both of these really make sense physiologically. You're going to need more support when you go from an airway that has 100% or very little, 0% leak, to an airway that's non-invasive that has a leak of about 80 to 90%, which we usually see in our neonates. So when you have that air leak, you have a lot less respiratory efficiency, and therefore, this number goes up. This number really is not getting to the lungs at all. And in fact, this pressure of 16 with the endotracheal tube is probably being seen by the lungs, but a pressure of 20 with a 90% leak, you obviously, you, your lungs are seeing a lot less than that. So these patients did very well, and what we learned from this is when you extubate a, ba a baby from NAVA to NIV-NAVA, go up on the NAVA level, and typically what we do clinically is we just go from one to two, but anticipate that you're going to need higher pressures, and anticipate that by setting your pre-pressure limit up higher. Now, I talked about the peak pressure limit and not to be scared about it and not to limit the babies out and how high they can go. But the question then came, how accurate is that? Are we going to really put our babies at risk for barotrauma? What's going to happen with these babies? So we looked at 12 of these babies that were on non-invasive ventilation. Um, and as you can see, they're 800 grams, they're 26 weeks. So these are small, immature, premature babies. We looked at a total of 540,000 breaths, so over half a million breaths of babies on non-invasive NAVA, and we came to about 45,000 breaths per baby. Now, again, if you realize that when these babies breathe at 50 times per minute and they get 70,000 breaths a day, that's only about 12 to 14 hours, maybe 15 hours worth of data out of a day. But we wanted to know 
at these different lava levels, what were their pressure distribution? How much pressure were they actually asking for? Up here, you can see our pressure distribution. It's divided between 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, and 30 to 35. The part that scares us is up here. Four and a half percent of these babies are getting these high pressures. 12% are pressures higher than 25. Keep in mind, this is all non-invasive with a 90% air leak, so very little is getting to the lungs, but these numbers still scare us as neonatologists. If we were doing this baby on typical non-invasive ventilation, we would have probably had the baby on 20 over PEEP. And that would be right around here. If we had done that, then 100% of the breaths would have been here. What we would have saved was the baby would not have been exposed to those breaths. But what we would have lost was, look at this, we've got 43 plus 15, which is 68, plus another 20. About 85 plus percent of the breaths came in with pressures less than 20. If we had had this baby on 20 over 5, we would have overventilated the baby for 80 percent of the breaths because we were scared of 10% of the breaths. So my take from this is that these recruiting or side breaths are vitally important to the baby to allow them to ventilate at very low pressures for most of the time. And on the bottom here, you can see the breakdown between the different NAVA levels. So, NIV-NAVA can be used successfully in our premature infants. You expect to see higher NAVA levels and see higher PIPs compared to um, invasive NAVA, and that's due to the large leak. Premature babies self-limit their peak inspiratory pressures due to their ability to terminate their inspiratory effort, possibly from something like the herring brewer reflex or the pressure um, barrier receptors in the lungs. And further studies are needed to determine if the use of NIV-NAVA can prevent intubation, expedite extubation, prevent reintubation, and ultimately decrease chronic lung disease in our babies. Thank you.